So thank you everyone for joining us for Skype a Scientist Live. Uh, we do this every day during the quarantine time. Uh, and today we've got something a little different. Uh, we're talking all about political science, so more of the social science side of things. So I'm super excited to hear all about it. So uh, today we have Andrea Jones-Roy joining us. Uh, she is a political scientist and we're gonna hear all about it. So do you wanna introduce yourself? Uh, sure. What political science really is, yes. uh, what you all study and um, yeah. Cool. Questions. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I do appreciate that political science is perhaps a different pace from what you're used to. And as a political scientist, uh, we forever live in insecurity that we're not a real science. Uh, so I feel especially honored that you've taken the time to join us to talk about this today. Uh, so my name is Andrea Jones Roy. Uh, I am a political scientist. And so political science is uh, basically trying to use scientific methods to understand political processes. So I think the quickest comparison is what economics is for understanding money and supply and demand and all of those things. Political science is trying to take those principles of science, data, make drawing theories, testing it with hypotheses, all those good things that we do in regular natural science and applying it to the political world. And so we focus on lots of different things. Um, I run a show right now on, on YouTube uh, every week called Ask a Political Scientist, and we're mostly focused on American politics. So a lot of people study American politics and they study things like what gets people uh, more likely to vote or why do some people uh, participate in politics all the time, you know, donating, volunteering for campaigns uh, or just really engaged with politics and why are some people less engaged? Uh, what are the differences in that kind of engagement or voting based on gender or race or the intersection of the two, things like that. And other political scientists, including me, study international relations. Um, I in particular study the role of the media in uh, talking about conflicts in different countries, I focus on China. Um, and then even further political scientists study other countries and try to compare them. We're mostly American centric, uh, at least in American political science, take other countries and say, well, what can we learn from them and apply that to the United States? So it definitely has a lot of relevance to, to all the news going on right now, but you know, it's something that's more or less been a science for the last like 100 years in a formal way. Awesome. Most people watching maybe have heard, you know, political science in the more broad, like political theory, like, you know, Plato and Aristotle and what is democracy and is democracy good? And it's fair to say, okay, it's taking those early principles and applying the scientific method to those to actually understand what makes a government good, right? Right. Yeah. Cool. Easy uh, stuff. <laughs> sounds yeah. super complicated. And not at all fraught with, you know, problems of inference or politicization or anything like that. So. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard for me to not ask questions that are just like, how do we... Uh, right just make it more better for us. Yes. Well, I mean, look, a lot of, I mean, a lot of social scientists do apply to the real world. So most of right. the research isn't necessarily immediately, it doesn't have like an obvious policy implication or like a, in this case, do this on Twitter instead of that kind of implication. Right. But, you know, some of the things I try to at least encourage the, the political scientists I talk to, to, to help us think through what might be more beneficial. So there it can kind of help right. um, a little bit. But yeah, that's not, that's more the work of like policy, which is like, how do we fix right now? Right. But hopefully, exactly. you know, in the long term, uh, another analogy is sort of like, uh, and I'm out of my lane here talking about the natural sciences, but something like, you know, I study uh, marine biology and I study, you know, what makes a particular, I, I don't know what marine biologists do, right? But I'm studying something related to fish and what makes them thrive and all of that. And that certainly does provide a backdrop for more immediate policies around like climate change, right? That, right. That's the kind of analogy here. That was a terrible analogy. I'm done talking about fish. That's it. That's fine. You can talk about <laughs> fish all you want. What we, Great. I'm here to expound on beside. fish. Yeah. The last yeah. thing we need is more, this is the most political thing I'll say, I promise, is more social scientists pretending to know things about other sciences. So I'll invent there. That's generally true. <laughs> we need fewer, fewer people who are an expert on one thing pretending to know everything. That's Indeed. one of the things that Skype a Scientist is actually really trying to focus on, like mm. showing that a scientist knows about the thing that they know about. And so yeah. it's are looking for answers don't just go to the scientist like the bill nye yeah go to the person who knows the thing that right you know. so like right. if you have a question about squid yeah ask me but if you yeah. have a question Perfect. about like <laughs> climate change ah i right. probably don't know but i can tell right. you who you can right. find that will know right. um and so okay so we have our first question um, when it comes to studying political science, do you actually use your newfound data to predict election outcomes? Hmm, we do. Well, let me put it, let me back up. We do try to, let me put it that way. So election outcomes are 
of course, very, very difficult to predict. Uh, many uh, viewers have seen, I'm sure, you know, Nate Silver's 538 predictions. Every news outlet has their own prediction this time of year uh, in an election cycle. I actually worked for, uh, for 538 for about a year in the lead up to the midterm election. So I was involved in helping basically enter all the data from the polls into those models. And I would say that generally political science is one step back. A lot of political scientists, speaking of staying in our lane, do like to uh, uh, make their own predictions about what's likely to happen. But we're much more interested in like longer term trends. So we're interested in things like what makes you know, someone more likely to win in any election, not necessarily the current one. Though we do like to take data from the current world and say, given what we know about lots of elections, what do we think is going to go on here? So let me be more specific. So one big thing that I'm sure is not news to anyone uh, that tends to predict who wins, say, a presidential election, at least, is the economy. So generally, the economy doing better means that an incumbent uh, 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 candidate or a candidate who's the same party as the current candidate, if they're at the end of their term, right, they're more likely to win if economic conditions are good. So of course, a lot of political scientists right now are looking at the economy and saying, oh my goodness, what on earth could this mean for November? And we've never seen, at least in you know, the last 30 years, so another premise of political science is that we can learn something from the past about the future, right? So we are in uncertain times because of the pandemic. We've been in uncertain times because of other political things that are new this time. But we like to think that generally, be, what we know about the economy is likely to hold. Okay, but this is a weird case where the economy being horrible it's tough to say whether that's the likely to be something that voters blame the president for. If anything, we might say that uh, some voters, especially the current president's base, would think that he's done everything he can to make the economy as strong as possible, despite what we would call an exogenous shock, an outside shock to the system. So right now, I mean, this is very much a, a who knows scenario, I think, for any scientist in any field, uh, especially anything related to society. But generally speaking, we like to say, well, what's likely to happen based on what we know in the past. Another big thing that tends to predict uh, how well someone does is in an election is voter turnout. So simply how excited are people to vote? And so there's a lot of political scientists doing work trying to understand how emotions affect politics. And are people more likely to vote if they're angry or if they're anxious or if they're filled with hope? Uh, and there's a lot of interesting work going on um, kind of broadly. And so again, looking towards November, are Democrats, Republicans, independents more likely to be angry? Are they more likely to be excited? Are they more likely to be anxious? And what does that say about the future? So that's not prediction in the, in the way that we see it on like Nate Silver's 538, but it's still a broader um, kind of prediction that we like to make. But yes, follow any political scientist Twitter account and they will be making predictions. <laughs> right, very right. cool. Um, so someone would like to know who is affected by your newfound data and who can use the data uh, that you produce? Hmm. So that's a great question. Uh, there's a big push in political science, as well as I think most sciences, correct me, um, uh, folks watching, uh, if I'm over overstating, uh, to make data transparent and available. So I am a professor at NYU, and I actually teach a course called Data Science for Everyone. Uh, because I'm a political scientist, most of the data that we use in that class is political data. We, ha we use political data about wars, uh, political data and predicting what causes them, political data about the relationship between government's corruption and happiness, and political data about how do you measure how democratic or not democratic a country is, and can you connect that to other outcomes you might care about. And all of that data is public. And so we believe very strongly in political science, most of political science, that data should be publicly available. So I'm happy to share links. Uh, I'm not sure what the best way to do that is to some data sets that I think are very cool in political science. But generally, even if you're not a political scientist yet, you can absolutely use the you know, data analysis skills that you have to, to look at data sets that are out there. And we would welcome uh, uh, students, viewers, uh, non-experts who are statisticians or have a background in statistics to start playing around with that data. Again, the theme of you know, uh, the world right now is we shouldn't all be weighing in on areas that we don't totally understand. But most of the data that's, that's out there is really well documented. And you can you know, reach out to the people who've constructed those data sets uh, and I think this is an area where, where the more minds we have on, on the information that we have, uh, the better. Very cool. Um, so what's the thing that you do the most with your job? I know your job is like many different. I have many weird jobs. Yes. Yeah. So, so at NYU, my, which is my primary job, uh, I teach uh, data, so data science for everyone. I teach um, undergrads who are, don't have a background in statistics or in working with data how to think thoughtfully about data, 
especially data about the political world, which, you know, we see again, to, to keep talking about the data that's all around us right now, we see how difficult it is even to measure something as simple as how many people are truly infected with this disease, how many people are being admitted or released. Every hospital has slightly different ways of collecting data. So you can, and that's a more tangible thing to measure than something like how satisfied is someone with the government? How strongly does that person uh, uh, consider the party that they're affiliated with to be central to their identity? Those are really, you know, uh, how optimistic are you that, that the government is gonna work in your best interest? Those are really hard things to measure. So a lot of the time I work with students to think about how could we turn those ideas uh, into numbers and then how can we use those numbers to actually uh, uh, understand things about the world, like what makes citizens feel more represented, right? Um, but the other thing that I do is my actual research. And as I said, I study the media and I study how the media in China covers international events. And I can get into those details uh, further if anyone's curious. Um, but I also do a lot of work with companies to try to use these things, that, the skills that we have in political science that, you know, turning complex things into numbers. I try to use that um, with companies to help them measure things like what is their corporate culture? Is it a place where people are engaged? Is it a place where people feel satisfied or that their CEO is looking after them? So a lot of the tools, it turns out, that we use to measure governments and, and people and culture and civic engagement and, and freedom and whatever else it is that we want to measure in politics, it works really well with companies. So I've only recently found a lot of satisfaction applying my work to help organizations, nonprofits, companies, uh, occasionally governments in trying to figure out internally how do we make this a better place to work because the goals of political science and companies are similar which is we have a bunch of people working in a hierarchical system and we want people to kind of do the best and be the most satisfied and and be well off and so I've been doing a little bit of work outside of academia uh, in that area and that's been very fun as well. Awesome so yeah. when you're collecting this data like how does that data collection look like is this survey data like what are we working with? So it's, uh, it's a huge mess, I would say, <laughs> in that, you know, as I said, I think one of the most interesting things about political science is unlike economics, which, you know, I'm, uh, we'll compare it to maybe the social science we've all hear about most, the things that we're interested in are not readily available as numbers. So again, that's not always true for economics, but in economics, it's sort of, you know, the price of something is there. The, the number of people buying a new home is there and we can work with those. We have to do a lot more work typically in political science to turn that world into a number. So indeed, survey research is a very big part of political science. I don't personally do that in my political science work, but a lot of political scientists do and I do it with companies. And so that can take the form of longer structured interviews. And there's a lot of scientific methods out there about how to run an interview in a way that's as objective as possible. Of course, there's always gonna be subjectivity, mm -hmm. but questions like, so here's, a, here's an example that I learned a long time ago that I thought was useful. Um, you know, not asking leading questions in a survey. So do you, th you think the government's doing really well, right? Like is not an okay question to ask, but you know, how satisfied are you with the government in terms of what it's providing to you and your family is a better question. It also turns out that there's tricks for asking good questions about sensitive topics. So for example, asking someone, are you racist is a really bad way of finding out if they're racist, but a really good way to figure out, well, a better way to figure out if someone's racist is to say, do you know anyone? who is racist. It turns out people are gonna be like, I'm not racist. And then you're like, do you know anyone who's racist? You're like, oh yes, yes I do, right? And so even then that's subjective, it's still self-reported, but it's a way to get a better sense of what is actually going on rather than putting people on the spot. Another cool one that I recently learned about, this is from a faculty member at a place called the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, she's a political scientist, but also a psychologist. She did some, some work on predicting elections. So again, on elections where, um, kind of a, a complicated simulation, but basically one of the issues with the Trump 2016 election was we think that a lot of few people, when you called them and said, are you gonna vote for Trump? They would say no, because at the time it was a very unpopular thing to say. I think it's still unpopular in some circles, but it's become more normalized for sure since he's won, right? But it turns out if you asked them, uh, rather than are you planning on voting for President Trump or voting for Trump, uh, if you say, do you know anyone who's gonna vote for Trump? Or how many people do you know who you think, what percentage of you, that's a much better way to understand what's going on. So those kinds of techniques are the things that we use in surveys and interviews to design uh, sort of better questions. Other things that we do, we, we um, go through historical records and actually just turn it into data. So I, I have a, a colleague who works on alliances and wants to know when forming uh, treaties or, or forming alliances with other countries is good for 
say preventing conflict or increasing trade or whatever. So he literally spent years and years and years reading old alliance agreements and coding them in certain ways and saying, well, this was between this one and this one, and these were the rules, and did they follow up on those rules? In my own work on the media, I do a lot of um, uh, programming to do things like uh, screen scraping. So I download headlines that appear in the Chinese media and then do content analysis around those headlines. Uh, and most of that, you know, it's very challenging because you're working in other languages as well, but that's the general idea. So we kind of do what we can to turn the world into data. Uh, as best we can. Sometimes people do experiments too. They'll put people in a room uh, and, and do something like, um, uh, have them, a, a friend of mine did, did a study like this where they wanted to understand um, ethics in politics and they wanted to understand whether people got angry when politicians lied to them. And it turns out that uh, they do, but it depends on the party. So if you say President Trump lied and you are a Republican, you're less likely to be angry than if you're a Democrat. But it turns out in this experiment, they would have people come into a room, and I'm gonna do her study a disservice. They would have you come into the room, and then half the time they made Democrats and Republicans write a paragraph about the importance of honesty. And then they said, how mad are you that President Trump lied about whatever. And having written that paragraph about honesty caused Republicans to be more critical of President Trump. Huh. Which is a cool finding, and it's experimentally very clever, uh, what that means for the election, I don't know. If you're a Democrat out there, do you want to assign a paragraph to Republicans around the country on honesty? I'm not sure. But so we try to do a lot of different things to kind of tease things out. That's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but research No, that's super cool, favorite. though. That was okay. really awesome. Cool. Um, do you have to be really good at math to be a political scientist? It depends on what kind of political science you want to do. I am not particularly good at math. I've never been someone drawn to math. I will confess I originally went to political science because I liked writing essays. And then I got to my PhD program and the first year was nothing but math. Like I was like statistics, matrix algebra, game theory. If anyone uh, uh, is familiar with game theory, that's basically using math to uh, uh, predict what people in strategic interactions are going to do. So what people, if I'm negotiating with you, what's my best move, that kind of thing. So there is room if you are mathematically inclined. We definitely love mathematicians in political science. There's a lot of opportunities, both for statistical modeling and this game theoretic work that I was describing, but you definitely don't have to be good at math uh, to be a political scientist. There's a lot of great work, at, like I said, um, a lot of work around, you know, surveys and experiments. I'm going to make my survey and experiment colleagues angry. Um, but that involves really just being thoughtful about how could I ask a question that gets an answer that would really tease out the thing that I'm interested in? How do I design an experiment that would really test what I think is going on here under the surface? And that requires much more imagination and creativity than I think a lot of people normally assume when you're thinking about science. Yeah, creativity is so, so, so important for science. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you use predictions in political science to predict wars happening or war outcomes? Yes. Uh, I mean, again, as we're seeing in the news all the time, models and predictions are imperfect. And war is something that is absolutely, you know, involves so many different variables that it's not like we can predict it, you know, on April 3rd in 2022, there's going to be a war from whoever and ever, right? It's not a crystal ball. But absolutely, one of the biggest motivations for studying something like war is to figure out, well, how can I prevent it? How can I, once a war starts, figure out how to make it more likely to end quickly or end with fewer casualties? There's an area of research that I think is really interesting. It's not my area, but I really admire this area, which is how do you come to a negotiated settlement on a war that makes it less likely for another war to break out? I mean, you think about um, a lot of the conflicts that we see in the world today, they're often conflicts that are iterative, conflicts that keep kind of cropping up over and over again. So Israel, Palestine, India, Pakistan, North Korea, South Korea, North Korea, US, you know, North, whoever, right? These are, are, are repeating conflicts. And so a lot of people are interested in political science right now to say, well, look, what are the conflicts that have ended? And then that was the end. And what can we learn from those conflicts about how to, prov how to, how to negotiate peace settlements with other ones um, so that they kind of, don't keep going. And, and it turns out the answer is very complicated uh, and requires reaching a settlement that both sides can think that they won uh, and often having a third party enforce it sometimes can work, but sometimes can't and all of those things. But there's a lot of interesting work, even, even more broadly about the start of war, which says like, look, lots of countries disagree over lots of things, but only a very small percentage of them turn to violence. 
And there's very interesting and intriguing empirical patterns out there where it turns out that if the both countries are democracies, they're less likely to go to war. And so a lot of people saw that, you know, 20 years ago and were like, oh my God, we need more democracies if we want fewer wars. Well, it turns out if you look, but that was one step. The next step in that research said, well, it turns out democracies tend to go to war all the time with non-democracies. So maybe that's less promising on far as democracy, democracy goes, um, what's going on there. And so what is it about these, these disagreements that cause them to escalate to war? And it turns out there, the answer is a mix of a lack of trust, which my goodness is so complicated to measure, um, and, and escalation on the part of either side. And so a lot of research goes into saying, well, how can we make sure that both sides don't escalate to a point of no return? So right now, political scientists, for example, are closely watching the U.S. and Iran because they seem to be playing this like tit for tat escalation that's making us nervous. And one of the things political scientists are looking for is, are either side absolutely tying their hands? Trump, you know, Iran's government, like to, uh, to a point where they can't back down. And once they reach that, where they have no exit option, then we get concerned. So again, these are long answers. And again, it's not really point prediction, but it's like, what are the conditions that we can in, uh, put into place that make war less likely? It's kind of like, we can't predict, I'm gonna be grim for a second. We can't predict whether someone will have cancer, but we can come up with recommendations that are tentative, right? But we think things like exercise, eating well, not smoking, we think that those things help. So that's another way to think of political science is like, how can we set ourselves up for success so we have less war rather than, you know, we'll have a war in six weeks, which I hope that we won't. Hopefully not. We yeah. might, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no one knows right now. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what got you interested in political science in the first place? I was an international relations major in undergrad. Uh, a long time ago, that was like the sexy major of the time. And that's what everyone studied because they didn't know what to do with their lives. And I was one of those people, I had no idea. And uh, I went to a PhD program only because I had a professor in undergrad who I thought was really amazing. And we would write these big essays where we'd be like, what is the nature of war and why is war inevitable? And it was these like soul searching philosophical things uh, that I thought were super fun. Then I went to grad school just because I liked doing that. And I was like, I'd like to do more of that. And as I said, it was a real shock when I got there and they said, great, we're doing statistics. And it was matrix algebra in particular. I was like, I don't know what, like eigenvalue, all this stuff. And I was like, I'm just here to study conflict. Like, what is going on? And it really took several years of doing all the statistics and the math work to really appreciate that actually these tools are really, really powerful ways to actually generate insight on these bigger, loftier questions. So it actually, I was sort of a slow burn on political science. I was very skeptical for a while. And I think around year four, I was, uh, uh, they finally broke me. And I was like, you know what? This is a very cool way to figure out really complicated and deep things. And so uh, from there, I've just been very excited about it ever since. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so for someone who's looking to work in politics, mm. uh, should you study some sort of political science? So. Increasingly, yes. I would actually say that, you know, if you had asked me that 10 years ago, I would say maybe that's not the only, or not, there's many ways into this. Um, I would say maybe not, um, because political science is sort of a longer term way of thinking about the world. And so if you're interested in working like on, for a campaign or running for office, maybe something more on the organizational side, but I don't know, that was 10 years ago, right? Now, so many of my political science colleagues uh, from my PhD program are working on campaigns. And part of that is the rise of big data, data science, and just this realization that we can learn so much about the, wor the social world by using the data that's generated. And so, you know, I think the Obama campaign was the most famous, but certainly not the only one to really use things like social media and online marketing to push for a campaign. And the benefit of all of those things, I mean, it's also creepy because our data is being owned by whoever, uh, uh, who knows really, uh, is that you can measure all those things really well. So does you know, Twitter engagement of your base make people more likely to turn out to vote for you? Again, do political ads that, that elicit fear versus anger, does that make uh, people more likely to turn out to vote for you or donate to your campaign? So absolutely right now, campaigns are desperate for people with political science skills, which includes this mix of statistics, modeling, being able to collect interesting data, being able to you know, screen scraping, what people are saying on Twitter, it's a little bit unethical, but you get the idea. Um, news coverage and things like that. A very good friend of mine, um, maybe this is a bad example given how the campaign turned out, but a very good friend of mine was one of the head data scientists for Amy Klobuchar's campaign. And so he was in Minnesota at their headquarters, basically churning through the data every single day and using what he'd learned from political science 
to really be thoughtful about what you can predict and what you can say based on these models. And cool. frankly, I mean, they, they had a great campaign, so, so it's right. really cool to see. Um, so you said you think that screen scraping of Twitter is unethical? This is not my area, um, but that I, there is a lot of open questions about how political scientists, how social scientists in general can use social media data in an ethical way. Oh. Okay. So on the one hand, you could argue, and this is an open question, right? Okay. And I talk about data and ethics a little bit in my data science class, but this really is not my area. Mm -hmm. But it's an open question, right? So when I participate, let's, let's you keep using Twitter as an example. So Twitter is more or less public. I think you can uh, adjust your, your posts to be private, but I, I don't. Uh, and I think many people are just public. So anyone can sign into Twitter and see what you've said on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. And the question is, if I am going through and doing a study, and I want to say, you know, what is the, I do something called sentiment analysis, which is are people generally talking in a way that's positive or negative about say President Trump? And we would say, how have those trends changed over time? I could go through and say, I'm gonna pull a random sample of people on Twitter or even just the people I follow, which isn't random, but let's say I do it and say, well, half the time people are positive, half the time people are negative. That's fine. And you know, there's complications around inference for that, but is that ethical? I have now just taken a whole bunch of people and effectively put them in a research study without their knowledge or consent. Now most, well not most, uh, many scholars think that that's vaguely okay because you've consented to it by putting your thing online and I'm not really doing anything to you and I'm using the data anonymously, but even then it's tricky, right? Mm -hmm. It's much more challenging and this was a real issue, again, uh, 10, eight years ago where political scientists got excited about doing manipulations online. So what if I, you know, write a bot that promotes a particular candidate for a month and follows particular people who are influential? Does that make the candidate more likely to win an election or not, right? Now I'm actually interfering with people's lives and I'm interfering with people's Twitter feeds and I'm putting them in an active study where half the people that I, who follow me are exposed to my posts and half the people are not. That's generally now considered unethical. And so we got very excited about these treatments and controls, but that more or less has, has, is not something that people do anymore because that seems totally unethical because you're mm -hmm. interfering with someone's life. You're affecting what people are being faced with. But this was right. an issue even before, and this is part of the reason it's really challenging to study political science. Mm -hmm. This was an issue long before the internet. Think about uh, receiving in the mail like flyers about a particular candidate or that say vote yes on whatever proposition. We all get those. And a lot of political scientists 50, 60 years ago wanted to know, do those things make a difference? And so you could easily imagine getting excited about sending a postcard to half the people in some you know, area and not the other half, and, and half of them get exposed to a, an article that says, here's how great this candidate is, and let's turn out, see if they won, right? Well, that is kind of unethical too, because you're again, putting people in a study. And so even, even longer ago, there's a lot of questions about ethics when it comes to talking about politics. Cool. Um, why can libraries gather votes and where do they bring them? Why can libraries gather votes? I don't know. Do they gather? I don't know what that means. Uh, me either. This is a, okay. a, a yeah. good question. I don't know is a very valid answer. Yeah. Okay. So we can just say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's record keeping around who votes for what, but I, I would doubt that. I mean, and that's one of the other things that's, that's tricky again, ethically in political science is, you know, we, Two things really uh well one ethically and one scientifically so ethically you know we can't know who you voted for because we have uh anonymous votes right mm -hmm. and the best that we do if we want to understand you know the relationship between say you know uh what what encourages someone to go out and vote is is exit interviews you know people saying who they voted for and guessing about things like maybe their race or their gender or their level of education or their party affiliation or whatever right or we just use these aggregate you know, election outcomes that come, which is to say 60% of so-and-so uh, types of people turned out. But we can't really do any kind of mapping between the people we interviewed and who they voted for. So it's really hard from an ethical and a causal perspective to actually understand our models because we don't, legally, we can't know in the end who you voted for. We could ask you, but we don't know if you're telling us the truth, right? Right, cool. Um, what emotion drives people to vote the most? Mm. So I'm going to do a shameless promotion of my own show, which is on Thursday on Caveat's YouTube channel, uh, where we're studying anxiety and politics. So under, under normal circumstances, I would consider it gross to, to promote my own show on your show. But 
have it's been okay. talking about emotion for the last two weeks. So last week, we had a political scientist named Davin Phoenix. We talked about the relationship between anger and politics and actually how anger works differently for uh, Black Americans versus white Americans. Um, and then this week, we're talking about anxiety and politics. So, so the verdict is out. Generally speaking, uh, this isn't my area. This is based more on my reading of these other experts' research. Um, generally speaking, negative emotions, we think, are, are more likely to get people out to vote. And there's some discussion now about whether it's fear or uh, fear, anxiety, or, or you know, kind of perceptions of threat, or it's anger. The thinking, and again, this is all, we're still studying this, uh, the thinking originally after the 2016 election was that it was fear that promoted, that motivated uh, people to vote for Trump. And now looking back, political scientists are thinking perhaps it was much more likely to be anger. And some of that comes from surveys and experiments, and some of that comes from sentiment analysis, like I was talking about, in terms of how do we talk about things like, um, like immigration, and is it, are, we, are people angry or are they fearful, right? Uh, the work that, uh, that Davin Phoenix, our guest last week, uh, spoke about suggests that, that actually, so anger is a motivator uh, generally, but it turns out it's a little bit different for Black Americans versus white Americans. And so this is where you see you just keep pushing the boundaries and try to understand more and more. So, so his argument and his research, both experimental and survey research statistics, suggests that white Americans are much more likely to be motivated by anger compared to black Americans. And he posits that there's two reasons for that. One is that because of stereotypes in the United States around race, black Americans, both candidates and voters, uh, uh, are, are less likely to exhibit anger because of negative stereotypes about an angry black man or an angry black woman. So they're less likely to be socially allowed to project anger. So that might be part of it. He also argues that black Americans have been uh, you know, felt let down by the government for so long that arguments being made now about the lack of justice and how horrible things are, are landing less loudly among black Americans who are like, yeah, it's been bad this whole time. This is not news to us. So it's less of a trigger to motivate change in behavior. Uh, whereas white Americans who maybe have had it better, uh, I like your cat, uh, white Americans <laughs> who maybe have had it better, are more likely to get outraged now because our baseline is a little bit, you know, more optimistic about the government compared to recently. So as you can see, it's very much an open question. Generally speaking, negative emotions, sadly, do tend to promote whether it's fear or anger, I think remains to be seen. The one good news is that hope and pride can also motivate um, uh, voters. And again, Davin's work suggests that hope and pride, um, going back to the 1980s, has been shown to motivate black Americans in particular. So that's really Great. exciting, yeah. Um, what would you say the best and worst parts of your job are? <laughs> the best part is getting to think about all this messy, complicated, scary, infuriating stuff in like a thoughtful, precise way. So as you can see from just the example of, of emotion and politics, you know, we're not getting clear cut answers that are like, okay, do this and do that, right? But I personally find it to be really reassuring when I watch the news and it's overwhelming and it's scary and I'm frustrated and you know whatever your political ideology or political identity right now, we're all in the United States around the world, really anxious and scared and angry, maybe hopeful, maybe feeling helpless. I find that political science is just really empowering. And so whether it's doing my own research, which is like a, a teeny tiny bit of trying to turn a messy world into order just in my little corner of what I'm interested in, that feels empowering to me. And honestly, after I watch the news, I feel so much better. I just pull up a political science journal and I read an article because I'm like, oh, someone's trying to understand this. Like, I feel anxious. Let's see what people who, who, who know what they're talking about have to say about what this anxiety might do to this country politically. And that just makes me feel, it feels very empowering. It's kind of a relief. The worst part is no one knows what political science is. And it makes it really tough to engage with people. Part of the reason I'm extra grateful to be on here because most of the time, you know, I tell people I'm a political scientist and they're like, they're either like, okay, and change the subject or they're like, oh, cool, you're going to run for office. And you're like, ah, definitely not. That sounds horrible, right? right? But right. like, I like to think about what makes someone run for office, what makes mm -hmm. someone win, what makes people vote for them. Um, but yeah, it just sucks to be so excited about something and not have anyone have any idea what it is. Right. That's a tough part. I yeah. understand that yeah, um, yeah. Okay. most scientists get that most scientists get that yeah. in some sense. so um 
we're in like a super weird time right now, obviously. Yes. So if you historically would have been politically active, maybe let's say you would go canvas for a candidate, maybe, you know, you do a lot of these like in-person kind of events. What can individuals stuck at home that are typically mm -hmm. politically active do to get their candidate uh, elected if you can't go outside? Yeah, totally. And I, I too, uh, you know, get involved. So, so as a political scientist, I, I try to be as nonpartisan as I possibly can. As a human and as an American, uh, I am also quite politically engaged, usually. usually. Um, I, the best, that, the most convincing thing that I have heard is that more than ever, it's really valuable to get involved in your local politics. And this is something that was true even before the craziness and before we were all stuck in our homes. And I hear this, by the way, because I, I think about this all the time, I hear this from political scientists and I hear this from people who are also on campaigns uh, or do, you know, strategizing for different parties and things like that. And one of the biggest changes in how Americans talk about the news in the last decade, more, probably more, is that we tend to, you know, national and global politics are our new local politics. The amount of time being spent in, in local news, uh, both written, uh, print, TV, online that's about national politics rather than local has just exploded. And I am told, uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I am told that local politics are really not getting as much attention as they should or, or could, right? And that means money to candidates. It means informing yourselves about who the candidates are and really getting involved in becoming an educated voter. Uh, it means doing that work and then sharing that information with your friends who are maybe not as politically engaged and saying like, hey, I looked up who's running for state Senate and here are the people who I think are doing really interesting things and promoting those people. If you're someone maybe who is, who is frustrated by the overwhelming sort of, you know, white, older uh, male uh, folks who are in Congress, uh, those people get to where they're going probably because they start in local politics. So, so the pipeline really needs a lot of work. And we're, again, <laughs> whatever side of the aisle that you're on, uh, that's a good place to start working. And you can absolutely do that virtually by getting informed, um, sharing the news about politics. One of the biggest barriers to people turning out to vote is not knowing necessarily who to vote for in local politics. And so if you're someone who's already engaged, have a look at who's involved in your state politics, in your district politics, and, and then share that information with your, your friends who are interested in voting. I would say between now and the November election, the biggest, my personal view, the biggest differentiator is going to be turnout. And so doing what you can to get people excited about politics and whatever that looks like in your community, it's gonna look different in different areas. And community in this case can mean your physical geographical community as well as your online uh, uh, network, right? Since we're all in our homes. Um, I'm susceptible to this. I watch the evening news and I get freaked out about what the president is, is doing or not doing. Nonpartisan, but that's what happens, right? Um, but what can I do in my local politics? I will say that as uh, I'm, I'm in New York City and so, uh, I have never been more spellbound by local politics than I have in this past month. And I am going to try to do a lot more to pay attention to what's going on both in my city and in my state uh, between now and November after hopefully all of this is, if not behind us, you know, not the only thing that we're focused on because we've handled it well, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yes. Um, and, you know, have a look at, uh, uh, look up political science uh, papers and read them and uh, share the good news about political science. Uh, you know, I can again point you to some cool stuff about if, if you're interested, anxiety and anger and politics and things like that. Uh, uh, and read those papers, they're very readable papers. Uh, feel free to look for data sets. Again, happy to share those and do your own, you know, knowledge building work and sharing that way too. That's absolutely a way to help. Do you have any good like popular science type books for getting interested in political science? I, let's see, I, political scientists are not, I'll say it, they're not great at sharing uh, <laughs> their research to non-political science audiences. Uh -huh. um, and that's a longer complicated conversation about you know, how, you, how you have a career in political science and how you get recognized as, an, as mm -hmm. a scientist. And so a lot of that doesn't incentivize that kind of thing. I, what I can point you to, are uh, my favorite book is a book called The Causes of War by someone named Jeffrey Blaney, B-L-A-I-N-E-Y. He is, um, he's an Australian, he might be dead, I'm not sure, he was very old, uh, but it's a book that came out decades ago, but it, it doesn't really have any math in it. But what it does is in words, it explains how to think about what causes war 
in a scientific way. He says, well, you know, for example, if countries that trade economically together are less likely to go to war, what should we see in the world? We should see that countries that trade let more go to war less. And then he walks through history and tries to find out whether that's the case. And he does it all in words, it's prose, it's easy to read, it's beautiful to read, he's a great writer, but it shows you how political scientists think about the world. Since then, lots of political scientists have used his ideas and turned it into statistical models um, and game theoretic models, and they've more or less held up. So that's like a really cool intro. What I can recommend is a lot of political scientists are quite active on Twitter. Um, uh, uh, to the, the Anxiety in Politics guest that I'll have next week, Bethany Albertson um, at the University of Texas and Shauna Gadarian um, uh, are both on Twitter and they post a lot of resources to articles about anxiety in politics. Uh, I will also say that the Washington Post runs a series called The Monkey Cage. It's like a blog. And that is political scientists trying to connect their work to current events. And so that's a good resource to get used to, um, to get introduced to some of the scientists. I wish I had a better recommendation for popular science books. I will say that a lot of political science writing is quite good and quite accessible. So even if it's not targeted to, you know, non-specialist, it's quite readable. So, so again, Bethany Albertson and Shauna Gadarian's book is called Anxious Politics. And Davin Phoenix, the, the work on anger, race, and politics, his book is called The Anger Gap. And uh, both of those are on, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're on Amazon if you want to buy from Amazon. Uh, I don't know if local bookstores will carry it, but they're from Cambridge University Press, and you can buy it right from the press, too. So I wouldn't be shy about reading the actual work. It's quite good. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so we try to keep these at 45 minutes. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end. Okay. okay. The first question is, uh, what do you wish that everybody in the world knew about your field? And then the second question is, what do you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, what I wish people knew about the field is that it is, it is actually scientific and it's actually empowering to try to make sense of the madness and that if you're watching the news, reading the news, looking at Twitter and feeling overwhelmed and angry, take solace in the fact that there are people trying to systematically understand what's going on. That we're not actually just at the mercy of crazy news cycles and, and all the other stuff that's out there. There are people kind of, you know, the ocean is crashing and there are tidal waves and there's all these horrible things, but there are people looking at the deeper sea currents and really trying to make sense of all of this. Um, and to me, that's a huge relief. So that's the political science. Whew. Everyone knew about everything. Oh, data and models and what they can and cannot do, right? So data is, is not a perfect representation of the world. It is an imperfect snapshot of a current moment in time and place. And so right now we're looking at all these numbers, but we've never been more obsessed with data, at least in my lifetime, than we are right now. And, you know, politicians and experts who are in the know are, are being cautious correctly around, look, we see this number go from here to here or go from here to here. Let's put big error bars around that for all kinds of reasons, including everything from as simple as whether the hospital records these records in the exact same way in every single place, or whether we got all the records each day, or whether we've diagnosed, right, et cetera. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't learn something from data, but it just means being humble when we look at it. And I'm just bracing myself, it's already happening, but I'm bracing myself for the like, well, the models predicted 10,000, you know, uh, 500,000 deaths, a million deaths, 50,000, you know, and we didn't get that many. Models are wrong, everyone overreacted. No, that's a sign right. that we did it right. So, right. so what models are and what data can and cannot tell us, I think are what I, I just, if everyone could just know that, I would feel better. That sounds <laughs> about great. It. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I thank you for well. having me. Hopefully everybody else did too. Uh, Aaron, thank you for signing for us as always. Oh, Aaron, thank, thank you. you. Aaron. Uh, and we will be back tomorrow with something. Uh, we're talking about ants with Greg Pask. Uh, he studies very cool ants that are very strange and have very strong Ooh. mandibles. Um, so we'll be learning about all the proper terminology about ants tomorrow um, and all sorts of cool stuff that ants do. Ants are more impressive than we give them credit for across the board. Uh, I'm very excited about this. Yeah, ants. I'm, forget political science. It's all ants. It's yeah. all ants from here. So that's <laughs> yeah. tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time again. Um, 
Yeah, and as always, we are uh, donor supported. So if you can support us at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist, that would be awesome. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the great questions. Oh yeah, no problem. All right, bye. Bye.